My name is Michael Bomford. I'm the chair of the Department of Sustainable Agriculture at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. And I'm here today to talk about farming and the Fraser Valley peatlands. I'll just start with a territorial acknowledgement. At, at KPU, we work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Samiamu, Tsawasan, Kakate, and Coquitlam people. And we, of course, we proudly share the name of the Kwantlen First Nation. And really, the Kwantlen Nation's territory overlaps uh, most of the area where KPU's campuses are. So I'll show you where our campuses are. We have five campuses in this area south of the Fraser. I work at the Richmond campus over on the, the farthest west on this map. Uh, we have two campuses in Surrey, uh, one in Langley and one in Cloverdale. So I hope this, uh, this map of Vancouver looks somewhat familiar and you can see where our, our campuses are. Now, part of the reason I'm trying to uh, kind of paint the geographic picture here is because I, our campuses are very close to ancient peatlands. And so the shaded areas on this map are peat soils, the, the ancient wetlands or peatlands of the Fraser Valley. And you can see there are a lot of them here at the near the mouth of the Fraser River. Uh, this is not typical of British Columbia. Canada has a lot of peat, mostly up in northeastern Canada, kind of in the Hudson's Bay area. Uh, but there's really not too much in the Fraser Valley, and there's not much uh, in British Columbia. Uh, and so this is this is interesting to have all of this peatland right by the mouth of the river. I work with my students on the KPU farm, which is right at the western edge of what's called the Greater Lulu Island Peat Bog, uh, just across the street from our uh, Richmond campus. Uh, we also uh, work on a, on a few other farms. So there's the KPU Richmond Farm School site, which has a small farmer incubator program. And that's down in South Richmond, right on the Fraser River. And there's the TFN Farm School, uh, which is on Suwassan First Nations land, uh, not far from the ferry terminal. And the KPU Horticulture Program has a greenhouse complex just north of the Langley campus. So part of the reason I'm interested in peat is because it's a tremendous store of carbon. And of course, our soils hold much more carbon than our atmosphere. And as we're concerned about the increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it makes sense to try to figure out how we can get more of that carbon into our soils and conserve the carbon within our soils. So this is a really fascinating map that was in a paper published by Paul et al. a couple of years ago in 2020. Uh, and it shows the concentration of soil organic carbon in the Fraser Valley. So you have a look at the legend over on the right hand side and you see that the the pale yellow is between about 10 and 55 grams of carbon per kilogram of soil and then you progress right down to the dark brown which is closer to 400 grams of carbon per kilogram of soil so 40 times as much carbon in those dark brown soils on the map as in the pale yellow soils. And if you look for the our dark brown soils, you see them right over at the mouth of the Fraser River, at the west end of the, the Fraser Valley. These are our peat soils, and the, the peat soils really have the highest concentration of carbon in the valley. So I'm gonna zoom in on that map and also show you the, uh, the, the peat deposits that I, I highlighted previously. So you can see the two together. And I'm gonna sort of zap back and forth here. So you see those peat deposits, and then I'm gonna take the red away so you can see the carbon concentration. And then I'll go back to the peat deposits and go back and forth. So you can see that really these high carbon soils are our peat soils. Isn't that cool? 
Now, these peatlands occur at near the mouth of the Fraser River, largely on land that didn't exist 10,000 years ago. And so this is kind of interesting, because when I talk about being in the traditional territories of the, the Kwantlen, the Musqueam, uh, the Tsuasin First Nation, I, these people have been in this area much longer than the land that I live and work on has existed. The people uh, precede the land. So after the ice receded, after the, the last ice age, I... Our, our topography looked something like that image on the top left there. That was 10,000 years ago. And you can see there was a little bit of alluvial deposition right at the mouth of the river, but the river was much further east than it is today. 5,000 years ago, you saw islands forming at the, uh, the mouth of the Fraser, uh, sort of beginning to form what's now Richmond and Delta. And the Garden City lands where I work and farm would have been waterfront property 5,000 years ago, right on the edge of the ocean. And down in the bottom right-hand side, you see the situation today. And you see all of that orange that's alluvial deposition. This is silt and clay that's been washed down the river and, uh, and formed the islands of Richmond and Delta. And this is where we find our peatlands on top of these islands. So, the, the silt washed down the river, it formed these islands. And over on uh, the eastern part of Lulu Island, where I work, uh, a, a shallow lake formed over the clay deposits that had been washed down the river. There would have been uh, reeds and rushes growing around the edges of that lake that fell into the, the river, or fell into the lake, rather. And What's interesting is they didn't rot because this was an anaerobic environment. There wasn't oxygen, so it didn't support microbial life. And, and so these things just sat there. They didn't decompose. Uh, and then over time, uh, they eventually actually filled in the lake and you started to get moss and, and shrubs and things growing up on top of this now filled in lake. So all of this material, this undecomposed organic matter, was the initial peat deposit. And then as the moss grew up on top of it and died and didn't decompose, uh, it actually created this mound, this, uh, this mounded peat bog that you see on the bottom right-hand side of the slide, uh, which was up above sea level. And that's what, uh, uh, what Eastern Richmond looks like and what a lot of the uh, the peatlands uh, in the west end of the Fraser Valley look like. So peat, and, and in Richmond, some, some of our peat deposits are six meters deep. It forms very slowly. It builds itself at about a millimeter a year. So when we're looking at six meters of peat, we're thinking about 6,000 years of accumulation. Uh, it, and, and, and we get this peat when we have more growth than decay, a lot of what forms the peat is this particular moss called sphagnum. So up in the top right-hand corner of the slide and in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, I have pictures of sphagnum. And it's fascinating because it is able to grow in an environment where very few other plants can grow. And it acidifies everything around it. So it creates an environment that's not friendly to microbes or to other, other plants. It's, um, uh, it, it's essentially... Uh, creating the perfect environment for sphagnum and not for, for very much else. Uh, and then, and it also has this tremendous capacity to hold on to water. So it, um, uh, it, it sucks up water, it needs to live in a wet environment, and it maintains a wet environment. Even in our dry summers, it's able to hold on to water uh, so it can, can keep growing. So it, it really is an ecosystem engineer. It, it creates the environment it wants. These accumulations of sphagnum or peat moss store an incredible amount of carbon. Our peatlands globally store a third of the carbon in our terrestrial ecosystems. That's about 550 billion tons of carbon. That, that's twice as much carbon as all of the world's forest biomass combined, even though our peatlands are just three to 4% of the land surface area. Another way of thinking about this then is there's way more carbon 
in an area of peatland than in an equivalent area of old growth rainforest. And here in British Columbia, we have lots of folks who are passionate about saving the rainforests, and that's a great thing. But it's that much more important that we conserve our peatlands that store even more carbon. Now, it's true that peatlands and other anaerobic environments uh, can release methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas, but they store so much carbon, they can take up so much carbon and every year that it more than compensates for the uh, methane emissions. In other words, conserving peat counters climate change. This is a, a natural climate solution. Unfortunately, if we start farming our peatlands, if we drain our peatlands uh, and, and till the peatlands and lime them and fertilize them, well, it can make a tremendously productive agricultural soil called muck soil, but that actually destroys it. Uh, when we do all of these things, when we alter the soil in that way, the soil starts to decompose rapidly. And all of that carbon that's been stored over thousands of years can be re released over a matter of decades. Not only, and so that of course releases the carbon dioxide, uh, but it also releases nitrous oxide, particularly if we're applying nitrogen fertilizers to our peatlands. And that's a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So just as conserving peat counters climate change, farming peat contributes to climate change. When we drain our peatlands, this is an environment that has always been wet. Uh, it's a wetland. When we drain them, we introduce oxygen into the soil. And uh, when, when oxygen is introduced, you get a lot of microbial life. It causes the peat to decompose. It releases carbon dioxide. And one of the symptoms of this is that the land subsides because of course, all of that carbon that was making up the peat disappears into the atmosphere and you see the, the soil collapse. It also presents a tremendous fire hazard because there's so much carbon in these soils and it can burn very easily. So once we get a peat fire going, it's really hard to put out. When we fertilize peat with nitrogen, that promotes nitrous oxide release. And of course, there are both natural and synthetic uh, nitrogen sources. Uh, nitrous oxide, uh, it has 265 times the heat trapping effect of carbon dioxide. So it's a really potent greenhouse gas. And when we lime uh, peat, which we might want to do to correct the acidity, uh, neutralize the acidity, well, that also promotes peat decomposition. And that, that also contributes to methane release. And methane has 80 times the heat trapping effect of carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. So when we're thinking about peat soils, they're very different from most other soils that we might use for agriculture. Uh, and I want to run through some of the some of the characteristics of a healthy peat soil versus a healthy agricultural soil. Uh, the peat soils tend to be quite acidic, uh, usually a pH less than four point five. And for a healthy agricultural soil, we want a pH in the range of about six to seven. Peat soils tend to be waterlogged. A healthy peat soil is saturated, where a healthy agricultural soil is well-drained. Peat soils tend to have low microbial activity and low microbial diversity because there aren't many things that survive in that very acidic environment. And, and, and it's an anaerobic environment too, where a healthy agricultural soil has high microbial activity and diversity. And perhaps if you just want to uh, you know, look at the images on the right, you can see a peat soil on the top right and a healthy agricultural soil down on the bottom right. And you can kind of uh, compare the two and, and think about these characteristics. For organic matter cycling, well, peat tends to have little organic matter cycling. In fact, that's why it accumulates organic matter. That's why it accumulates carbon, why it's, a, why it's sequestering carbon and, and fighting climate change. On the other hand, our healthy agricultural soils tend to cycle carbon rapidly. In fact, the breakdown of organic matter provides nutrients, which leads to the next uh, characteristic where our peat soils tend to be nutrient poor environments and our healthy agricultural soils tend to be nutrient rich environments. 
There aren't that many things that can live in these nutrient poor peat soils. Sphagnum is one of the few. Uh, peat soils tend to have a whole lot more organic matter than agricultural soils. Uh, typically more than 40% of a peat soil is organic matter where we seldom see more than about 10% organic matter in an agricultural soil. And then as far as water and cation exchange capacity, well, both of them tend to have high water holding capacity and a high cation exchange capacity. I, I think of cation exchange capacity as like the nutrient holding capacity. So a peat soil is low in nutrients, but it can hold on to a lot of nutrients if you wanna add them. And that's why people like to use this as an agricultural soil. So we use peat for agriculture in, in all sorts of ways. One is, is that we drain our peat lands and that converts the peat into what's called a muck soil. Drained peat is, is muck soil. It's rich, black. Uh, it's a great soil for growing root crops. Uh, when you drain it, it can drain well. Uh, of course, it's a low nutrient environment, but you can fertilize it and it holds on to those nutrients really well. So people really prize their muck soils for vegetable crop production. And uh, and if I think of uh, like the Cloverdale region, for example, uh, the south along the Nicomechal River uh, and, and the south of the, the town of Cloverdale, uh, there's a an area that was once peatland. And, uh, and it has been a very productive vegetable growing region for some time uh, because that peat was converted to muck soils. But after, you know, less than a century of farming it, most of that peat has disappeared. And that means that a lot of carbon has been released into the atmosphere as that soil degraded. The other way in which we use peat for agriculture is by mining it. And so on the right-hand side of this slide, you see these gigantic vacuum machines attract, attached to tractors that are sucking up peat, uh, probably from Northern Canada, uh, and baling it, putting it into a bag like that sunshine mix bag that might look familiar to anybody who's growing uh, transplants and, and uh, you know, created potting soil out of peat. Well, that's, that's horticultural peat, it's mined peat. It used to be that people uh, mined peat in order to burn it because it has a high carbon content and it's a valuable uh, fuel. So you can burn it in fireplaces or in uh, boilers. Um, nowadays, people don't burn peat all that often. Uh, but if you do, you have to pay a carbon tax on the peat. So this is from the, the BC Ministry of uh, Finance uh, laying out the current carbon taxes and and uh, if you're mining peat to burn it, you have to pay $66 for every ton of peat. Uh, you know, maybe uh, about half the price of, of an equivalent ton of coal. And I should say that peat, when it's under pressure for long enough, becomes coal. It's, we can think of peat as a proto-fossil fuel. Uh, it is uh, this high, this carbon-rich material. Uh, it, it can be a fuel. It takes thousands of years to form. Uh, and when we burn it, we rapidly release all of that stored carbon into the environment very quickly. Of course, the BC carbon tax only applies to the peat that we burn to produce heat or energy. It doesn't apply to the peat that we mine for horticulture or the peat that we lose when we drain our peat soils and convert them into muck soils. But the ultimate effect is the same. Uh, that peat is destroyed. The emissions are just the same as if we had burnt it. And uh, um, and to my mind, maybe we ought to be charging a carbon tax uh, for those emissions. Uh, in its Clean BC Roadmap, uh, the province of British Columbia says we're going to work with the ag sector to determine beneficial ma management practices to maximize carbon sequestration and its benefits to biodiversity, soil and water quality, and farm profitability. And we'll encourage producers to implement regenerative agricultural practices and technologies that improve soil health and biodiversity, allowing farmland to store more carbon. Well, this is a, this is a, a troublesome thing to me because these are all great ideas. These are all things that I support. And yet I see some tension here. Uh, if we're really serious about sequestering carbon in soil, 
it's important to restore our bogs and conserve our peat. I that is not necessarily going to advance farm profitability. I uh, and it's it, it is um and and soil health, as you saw, can be very different uh, depending on how we want to define it. Is our goal an agricultural soil or is our goal uh, a healthy peat? Uh, they're both healthy soils, but they are, have very different characteristics. We really haven't conserved many of our peatlands. Mostly we've converted our wetlands and peatlands in the Fraser Valley into uh, into perennial crop production. And so this, the, the map here, also from that paper by Paul et al, shows current land use in the Fraser Valley. Uh, you'll see the pale green for annual crop production, and we have a lot of annual crops. Uh, you'll see the darker green for perennial crops, and the darkest green is forests. Uh, and you'll see the, the brown on that map is our wetlands, the remaining wetlands in the Fraser Valley. There's not much of them. You see the big brown blob uh, just south of the Fraser River on the west side there. That's Burns Bog, which actually is conserved as a wetland. And it's the largest remaining piece of our original peatlands. But it's a small proportion of the original peatlands. And then um, over on the right. left-hand side, the bottom left-hand side, you see a, an image uh, trying to demonstrate um, how changing our land use affects carbon emissions. So on the top, of the, at the top of the y-axis, you'll see peatlands as the type of soil or the type of ecosystem that stores the highest amount of carbon. When we convert those peatlands into arable land, we follow the blue line on that graph down to a much lower carbon environment, which involves releasing a lot of carbon into the atmosphere over the years that that conversion happens. The pink line shows another um, change. It shows converting an arable land to a grassland. And grasslands tend to have hot, more carbon in the soils than arable lands. And so you actually see uh, an increase in soil carbon concentrations. Which, and so that's actually battling climate change or, or pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, but not nearly to the extent that you would have if you restored a peatland, if you could convert those arable lands back into, into bogs, working bogs and wetlands. Um, Mike? Yeah. Uh, the brown that should be over in Langley, uh, sort of just east of Barnston Island, I'm going to assume that is all gone. <laughs> that's, that's now a bit of an industrial park now. Right, yeah, yeah. So the so the gray on this is the built up and bare land, mm -hmm. but yeah. So you're yes, I think you're probably right that that would be gone now. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunate. Seems like we've lost so much. Yeah, yeah. And I'm back to the same uh, paper by Paul et al. 2020. Uh, this is another great map that shows changes in soil carbon concentration uh, since the 1980s. Uh, so, so what this map shows is that most of our soils are actually losing carbon in the Fraser Valley. Uh, if you look at the, the uh, legend over on the right-hand side, you'll see that the largest losses are shown in red, uh, but anything in yellow or orange represents a loss in soil carbon. Uh, and there are some greens, the pale greens, and even some darker greens that show a gain in soil carbon. Uh, but only 12% of the land in, this, in the Fraser Valley gained soil carbon over that 40-year uh, period or so. Uh, you know, 80, 88% of the land lost soil carbon. And you can see that this, this uh, map is largely orange and red there's not very much green. Where we do see little bits of green, it's in our forested areas and there's and it's in Burns Bog, uh, at least the northern portion of the Burns Bog uh, gained some carbon. And actually right over on the the um, uh, Garden City lands where we're farming, there's a little patch of pale green. Uh, and that's a, a bit of peatland that hasn't been lost, that's still, uh, still fixing carbon. Mm 
we're, you know, we're losing our soil carbon through the way that we're managing our land. We've also lost a lot of fish habitat uh, by, uh, by displacing our wetlands. So this is a, a map from Finn et al., uh, published in 2021, looking again at the Fraser Valley. And the brown shows our historical floodplain fish habitat. Uh, the red shows our current dikes. And the green shows the currently accessible floodplain, as in accessible to fish. You, you can see that of the original fish habitat, hardly any is left. And, uh, uh, and so these wetlands were doing double duty. Uh, they were sequestering carbon and they were providing seasonal habitat for uh, for uh, salmon fry and other young fish. And that's all been lost through the, the way we've managed our, our lands. I also have an image there uh, taken in 1890 of uh, indigenous people in a canoe on the Fraser River. And I, I want to emphasize that uh, there was a time when the Fraser was a major transportation corridor and but even even the island that I live on, Lulu Island at the mouth of the Fraser River, had about a hundred kilometers of navigable waterways cutting back and forth across that island. So indigenous people and early European settlers largely got around by canoe uh, through all of those uh, temporary or, or seasonal wetlands. Uh, that and and some of the the wetlands had large channels, large enough to bring a canoe along. This is a Google Earth image uh, of the Nicomechal River. So this is part of that farming region that is south of Cloverdale. And uh, and what I want you to notice is that rich black muck soil that you see in some of the image, but you'll also see these seams of silt or clay, uh, the pale white seams that are coming through. And in fact, on a lot of these fields, there's not much of that black left. So the black soil is the muck soil. It's the, the peat land. It's, it's the drained peat. Provides a wonderful agricultural soil. But over a few decades of farming it, it's largely been lost. And, uh, and there's not much of this muck, uh, muck left. As I remember I used to work in this region as a pest management consultant. Uh, in the 90s, and the soil was subsiding at about two and a half centimeters a year in the 90s. I, uh, when you think that it took about a, uh, that it was accumulated at about a million, a, a millimeter a year, uh, it's we were losing about 25 years of accumulation every every year just through our uh, just by growing vegetables, and. Uh, uh, and people were trying all sorts of things. We we're trying cover cropping and they are trying to add uh, composts and other sources of organic matter. But you can't, you can't keep up with that. There's no way you can replace uh, a soil that's like 60% organic matter. You, you simply can't uh, um, do that. There's, there's no management once you've drained it that will preserve it. So I'm back to the map showing our, our ancient peatlands, the our peat soils, and uh, pointing at the KPU farm where I work with my students over on the very western edge of the greater Lulu Island peat bog. And I want to um, just give you some context for that particular site. I, I, I know you've been there, uh, Lisa, it's very close to the airport. And so this is actually a picture taken in 1931 uh, from the current site of the airport. So the airport is on Sea Island and my farm is on, or our KBU farm is on Lulu Island. Uh, you'll see a couple of racetracks. There's one over on the right-hand side of the slide and one closer to the center of the slide. The, uh, the one in the center of the slide is the Lansdowne racetrack. And the KPU campus and the Lansdowne Mall sit right in the middle of what was once that Lansdowne racetrack. Beyond the Lansdowne racetrack, you'll see those dark black areas, and that's the peat bog. 
Uh, and so right across the street then from the Lansdowne racetrack and from our campus is the, uh, is the edge of the peat bog. And you can see it's huge. You can also see another bit of peat bog off in the distance on the far left. Uh, you'll see the airport. This is what the airport looked like in 1931. That's uh, right in the foreground of the slide. And they had just started building the airport in 1931. Uh, before that, they used to land planes on the field just north of the um, Lansdowne racetrack. So right, right beside where, where KPU is now. The, uh, one of the first things that people did in Richmond was build roads across the island. And they built um, eight roads that ran north-south. They started with number one road, and then they moved to number two road, a mile east of it, and then number three road, a mile east of that, and number four, and they went through to number eight. And those roads still exist today, uh, and they are still numbered one through eight. Now, what's interesting about those roads is that they just run north-south. They didn't connect to anything except the river. So people were using the river as the, the means of navigation and then unloading materials uh, and then using carts along the roads to, uh, to move back and forth north and south across the island. And then they, they built one more road. Eventually, they built a number nine road that ran east-west. And that number nine road is now called the Steveston Highway. So if you're familiar with uh, with Richmond, Steveston Highway kind of cuts along the southern um, uh, portion of that island and, uh, and connects all of those other roads. Now, when they started building the roads, they started with number one. And the way they did it, because this was a, a wetland, um, they it, it was wet all the time. So they had crews of, of uh, guys with shovels digging ditches, two parallel ditches. And they uh, they dug ditches and mounded up soil between the two ditches. And that became the elevated road. They did that for number one, number two, and number three. And then when they got to number four, they hit the peat bog. And they tried digging ditches and it just didn't work because the peat bog just kept collapsing in on itself. And so uh, they just laid planks over top of the bog for the road because they couldn't couldn't uh, make a ditch that would work. And that's what you're seeing here, number four road, which is immediately east of the Garden City lands where, where we farm. This is number four road in 1915. It's a plank road and you can see the old uh, Model T um, driving along, along the road. So these this, uh, planked roads elevated above the peat bog probably didn't do very much damage. Essentially the peat bog was fighting back uh, when they tried digging a ditch through it. But eventually people were able to ditch it and uh, and that inadvertently drained the bog uh, and started this uh, the process of decomposition and loss of, of soil carbon, cutting all of these roads through the peat bog. There's something else that happened on that land between 1904 and 1928, there was a rifle range at the, at the site. And so, uh, you can see these these fellows in their bowler hats out uh, for a day of shooting. Uh, the um, the the streetcar started running in 1905, and uh, and it ran right along the Garden City lands, along the or right along the Garden City Road, which is along uh, the west side of the Garden City lands. So uh, fellows in their bowler hats from Vancouver would come up with the rifles to uh, to shoot across the Garden City lands. And the image on the right shows um, what's now the Garden City lands and then adjacent to it, the Department of National Defense lands. And right down the middle of those two properties runs number four road. And what you're seeing is the targets that people were shooting at. You'll see that there were targets about every 10 yards across the property and on the other side of number four road. So they were firing shells over that plank road that we saw in order to hit targets over on the other side of the road. And now 24 years as a firing range probably had some impact on that peat. Here's another way that people were using peat in Richmond. This is 1940s and, uh, and people were mining it, uh, turning it into blocks and these blocks are drying. This would have likely been used for fuel. Some of it might've been used for horticultural purposes also, but they were 
big factories dedicated to extracting peat. And you can, you know, now we know that this represents a tremendous amount of carbon that was extracted from the soil and uh, and lost by by burning. So we're sitting on this quarter section. It's a half mile by half mile section over on the west side of the the bog. Uh, we're farming. Uh, we're farming the area that's highlighted in yellow. Uh, that's a twenty acre piece of this hundred and thirty five acre property. The eastern half of the site has been dedicated to bog restoration and conservation, and the city built a a dike. This, that sort of uh, curvy line that runs more or less diagonally through the property is a dike intended to separate the wetland, the bog on the right, from the agricultural lands on the left. And we are part of those agricultural lands. When we started talking to the city about farming on this site, I wasn't all that excited about it because I knew that there really isn't a way to farm peat sustainably, that we're going to lose it if we start farming it. But we went out and took a bunch of soil samples. And all of the X's on this map show the, the kind of soil sampling grid that we used. Every X is a soil sample. And we found widespread contamination. Uh, so the... Uh, the X's with arrows are the places where we sent those samples for heavy metal analysis. And we found arsenic and chromium, copper, lead, molybdenum, and selenium uh, at these sites. The, um, the colored arrows show which of these heavy metals we found. Uh, if the arrow's pointing up, we found it in the top, uh, uh, the top 20, 35 centimeters. And if it's pointing down, we found it around a meter deep. Uh, so just about every sample that we sent in for analysis had contamination above the agricultural thresholds. We also found when we did this analysis that there was some deep peat on the agricultural side of the bog. Uh, so, so that got cut off by the, the dike and, uh, and that's shown by the sort of brown uh, the, on this, this map. Now, why would there be lead and copper? It probably has a lot to do with the fact that there was a firing range here for uh, uh, all those years. Because of the contamination, the city really had two options. Um, we couldn't farm the peat directly uh, because there would be heavy metals in the vegetables. Uh, the consultants told them, well, they could um, we, we could extract that peat and ship it off to Abbotsford or dump it somewhere, um, or they could cover the peat. And that's what they decided to do. Uh, so they they brought in 70 centimeters of mineral soil fill from the airport because the airport was lengthening its runways. They needed to create safety strips at the end of the runways. Uh, so this was the summer of 20, uh, 2017. And, uh, and this was a huge operation. It was like 100 dump truck loads a day for a month, uh, bringing soil from the airport and layering it on top of eight acres on the Garden City lands. And you can see that uh, soil layered on top in this Google Earth image, that, that pale gray soil over top of the, uh, uh, the Garden City lands down in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. So they buried 70 centimeters, they, they buried the, the peat with 70 centimeters of soil, mineral soil, and then we put in drains. But the great thing about um, being able to drain it was that the drains didn't puncture the peat. So we put down the drains so that the bottom of the drain was uh, 70 centimeters below the new soil surface. And this meant we could drain the mineral soil and leave the peat saturated. Uh, which I think is probably about the best situation because that peat needs to stay wet in order to retain its carbon. And when peat is drained, you see subsidence. We have not seen any subsidence uh, over the years that we've been working there. So this is a, a good sign. It probably means that the, the carbon is, is still there. It also means that we can do all of the things on the mineral soil that would otherwise destroy the peat. So we can 
fertilize it and lime it and drain it and uh, you know just act as farmers uh, and hopefully leave that peat undisturbed down below. This sounds like a, a rather um, dramatic intervention. Uh, and I, I wasn't sure that this was kind of the right the right approach. But I was somewhat reassured to find somebody else in, in Norway doing essentially the same thing. Uh, they also, Norway has a lot of peatlands and uh, and they recognized that they there were a lot of greenhouse gas emissions when people tried to farm these peatlands. But the peatlands generally start out as a shallow lake. So there's a clay soil underneath the peat uh, that once held the water in that lake. And so what they've been do trying to do in Norway is simply flip it all so that they pull the clay up on top and put the peat down below, and then they farm the soil, the clay soil up above. And uh, and you can see in the image uh, up in the top right that they've got about 50 to 70 centimeters of clay sitting up on top of their peat. Uh, and when they uh, measure greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they see, of course, a dramatic reduction in carbon emissions when that peat is protected by the clay. They also see dramatic reductions in nitrous oxide and methane emissions. And that's what the graph in the center of this slide is showing. So we've got greenhouse gas emissions on the y-axis, the natural peatland uh, emitting a little bit of methane as shown by the, the orange there. Uh, but when they have the exposed peat that's being farmed, methane emissions shoot up as you see with that, uh, that big orange bar. And if you fertilize, that then they get both methane and nitrous oxide emissions. So either way, they're seeing a lot of greenhouse gas emissions if they farm the exposed peat directly. But when they bury the peat and farm the clay on top of the peat, they have much lower nitrous oxide emissions if it's unfertilized and even, even fertilized, um, the, their nitrous oxide emissions are quite a bit lower than when they, they uh, farm the peat directly. And they just, they're not seeing methane emissions uh, with the buried peat. So I said that we had 70 centimeters of mineral soil layered over our peat, uh, and, and that's over eight acres. So that's the area highlighted in yellow here. Uh, this is our, our currently farmed land, uh, and it is right across from uh, high-rise condominiums. And, and one of the, the people who lives on the 12th floor of one of those condo buildings uh, took this picture for me and, and actually takes great pictures of our, our farming progress. So that's uh, that's kind of cool to have a, a neighbor who uh, has an eagle eye view of what we're, what we're doing. So there's the area where mineral soil was layered. But I told you that we're actually leasing 20 acres from the city. And, and the city is uh, currently, and it has actually layered mineral soil over another 12, and that's the area shown in uh, orange here. So this is, uh, once we're able to start farming on that orange area, that'll be the full 20 acres on this uh, this site. So we're gonna be expanding substantially over this uh, over the next few years. Off in the distance, the area that I'm highlighting in red here is the area on the other side of the dike, the area dedicated to wetland restoration and conservation. So by layering soil, I'm hoping we protect the peat, but over on the far end of the, the property, I wanna be actually building new peat so we can continue to sequester more carbon. One of the things we've, we've been doing in that area where they um, layered soil over uh, on the, uh, the area that I had highlighted in red there, uh, there was actually some sphagnum growing over there. And I, want to, I wanted to rescue as much sphagnum as I could and get it over to the bog side, the, the wetland restoration side. So we did a community event uh, last spring where we were just pulling sphagnum from one side and transferring it across the bog to the other side. And that's the Richmond News article you see on the left-hand side there. Another thing I'm doing is actually propagating sphagnum in our dome. So that's the um, uh, top right hand uh, image here. That's uh, my sphagnum propagation system uh, that sits above our um, our pond in the uh, the solar heated dome. And that's the goal is that that then gets transplanted out to the bog restoration side to try to get the sphagnum growing again. And then I, you know, in the in the Richmond News article there, we were 
just hauling crates full of sphagnum, but I also got the front end loader out and started taking big front end loader fulls um, from one side to the other. And, and, uh, and that transplanting so far seems to be fairly successful. So what I'm showing on the bottom right is a patch of transplanted sphagnum just this spring. Uh, you can see that the wetland is indeed very wet and the sphagnum is quite happy in that environment. And that's what will ultimately build peat up again. So that sphagnum propagation system sits inside our solar heated greenhouse, this dome greenhouse, which is kind of a distinctive feature of the property. And I have a number of students doing research projects um, on uh, both sides of the property. We do a lot of agricultural research projects on one, on our side. Uh, but then uh, one of my students, Rue Badenek, um, was looking at the way that the city is managing the bog conservation side. And one of the practices they've been doing, they've been mowing every year in order to prevent the growth of a, an invasive birch that um, uh, tends to suck water out of bogs and dry them out. Uh, unfortunately, Rue found that the mowing is harming the sphagnum. And uh, so the, the graph from Rue's paper here shows mowed and unmowed plots and uh, uh, and the sphagnum cover is much higher in the unmowed plots than in the mowed plots. And the, the image on the right shows me in one of these plots. You can see a, an unmowed plot in the foreground and down below my feet, you're seeing a bunch of dead sphagnum that's dried out in the summertime. And in the unmowed plots in the background, you're seeing a lot of hard hack that is actually shading and protecting that sphagnum. And there's actually a fairly healthy sphagnum growth underneath that hard hack. So based on this research, um, we're, we were able to get the city to leave areas unmowed, particularly areas where birch isn't a problem uh, in order to try to get the sphagnum growing again. That is um, really exciting stuff, Mike. Absolutely. Have, um, Langley Bog here in um, Langley. It's part of the Derby Reach Brand Park, uh, Derby Reach Regional Park. And um, we have a researcher that she's actually been re replanting sphagnum moss herself in a couple of different ways. And so I'd really love to get her cool. talking to you guys. But um, we have an issue with fairly full grown birch trees that uh, the researcher would like to look into potentially pulling and getting rid of yeah the yeah. roots are pulling up too much water and um changing the uh or concerned that it's changing the water table in the bog so it's a real challenge yes i think that's a, a real concern exciting I, we need to get everyone talking it's very cool absolutely so i think that's it for me i i uh, want to just put in the pitch for saving the peat and restoring the bogs and uh and i honestly feel that from a an agricultural perspective um, we we need to recognize the value of peat as peat as a as a soil sink. Or, or sorry, as a carbon sink. Uh, and uh, and I think that very often that outweighs its potential short term agricultural value as a as a growing environment for our our vegetable crops. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mike. That was an incredible amount of information and your visuals are absolutely stunning. The historical photos though, of that um, basically a corduroy road along number four, I can't imagine the expense for the lumber day <laughs> to build an entire road. Yeah, yeah, of course, there were still trees back then, even in <laughs> Richmond. <laughs> true, very, very true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely stunning visuals. Thank you so much, Michael. It's it's great for understanding what we're trying to achieve here and uh, protect. And really exciting, the ideas of draining the uh, mineral soil, but not the peat below, because um, it's really important just to maintain that water in our peat bog. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on the uh, Richmond uh, Food Security Agriculture, what is it? <laughs> the Agriculture and Food Security uh, Committee or Task Force or whatever it is. The uh, whenever whenever somebody has a, a a request that will need approval from the Agricultural Land Commission, it has to come through our committee. Oh, wonderful! And, That's good. Uh, 
Um, and we get a lot of requests to drain peat soils or to uh, bring in fill. Yeah. And uh, and generally the it, because of course these are saturated environments. It's hard to grow very much on a on a natural peat soil. And uh, and and generally the Agricultural Land Commission has allowed uh, farmers to bring in fill, but they've actually in order, you know, they, they, they want to preserve the, the uh, peat soils of Richmond. So they actually ask that people excavate the peat, put down the fill, and then put the peat back on top so you can farm that peat, which I think is about the worst thing we can do. Because once that peat is separated from the peat below, uh, it's not going to be sucking up water anymore. And uh, and it's not going to remain waterlogged. It'll, it'll be uh, aerobic. It'll start to disintegrate. Uh, and you know we'll we'll solve the drainage issue for uh, a few decades until that peat disappears and we're right back down to the level that we were at before they brought in the fill. Yeah. Uh, so it's it, it's really an unfortunate um, kind of standard practice, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm hoping that we can demonstrate that hey actually if you put the fill on top you can farm that and sequester the carbon and preserve the peat. You're not going to be growing new sphagnum or building the peat anymore but at least we're not going to lose what we have yeah really important i i it just seems absolutely counterintuitive that they would suggest putting the peat on top but i wonder if it has something to do with um, the need for us to you know drain land and infiltrate water and you know good topsoil is usually the best way to infiltrate a lot of our storm water and maybe there's thinking the peat makes or the now dead and the, peat. the peat does make very good topsoil mm -hmm. for a while and then it disappears you know it, it just uh, it disintegrates when it's uh, when it's cut off from its what it yeah. needs yeah yeah frustrating i could see that yeah. being a <laughs> it requires a lot of dedication to be able to protect this stuff Excellent. anyway thank you for inviting me uh thank you for your time and listening to me and who knows, maybe somebody else will watch the video and and uh, and have some questions or thoughts. And Absolutely. I will get it up and running as soon as I can onto our YouTube channel. And really, really appreciate your time on this, Mike. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thanks, Lisa. Take care. Good night. Good night.